Welcome to the second module of this series, Types of Cognitive Bias. To recap from the prior module, radiologists use heuristics to make decisions when there is uncertainty, and this approach often helps us arrive at the correct diagnosis. Type 1 thinking is fast, like pattern recognition. Type 2 thinking is slow, it's analytical problem solving. Failed heuristics or errors in type 1 thinking contribute to cognitive biases and diagnostic errors. The goal of this module is for learners to gain an appreciation of the different types of cognitive biases. Their learning objectives are to list types of cognitive bias and discuss interventions that can mitigate cognitive biases. The problem with errors of type 1 thinking is because they are automatic, we often do not know an error has occurred. There are a large number of cognitive biases that are relevant to medicine and radiology. The types of bias that will be reviewed in this module include availability bias, alliterative bias, framing bias, blind spot bias, regret bias, and scout neglect bias. The first case is a 59-year-old with left ventricular assist device, abdominal distension, and worsening lactic acidosis. The images on the left are from a CT the previous day. The images on the right are for a current CT examination. The radiologist looking at this imaging notices that there is increased periapatic and pelvic hematoma. As he's scrolling through the images, he notices that there is a new perigastric hematoma that measures greater in attenuation compared to the rest of the blood product, likely representing a sentinel clot. The patient goes on to interventional radiology and has successful embolization of a bleeding gastroepiploic artery. Later that day, the same radiologist reads a CT exam performed in a 76-year-old with unexplained weight loss and sarcoidosis. This radiologist identifies very similar appearing perigastric hematoma extending into the omentum. He calls the referring physician and recommends a CT angiogram. The patient has a PET CT three weeks later and this is diagnosed as lymphoma. This is an example of availability bias, which is when we allow easily recalled experiences to exert undue influence on our diagnostic thinking. We rely excessively on what we know best. The characteristics of type 1 thinking are pattern recognition of perigastric hematoma, which is incorrect, and ignoring the clinical indication of sarcoid and weight loss. This patient didn't have any risk factors for perigastric hematoma. The intervention is to reference sources of information beyond one's personal experience, including relevant peer review publications, and get second opinions from colleagues. What's really interesting about this case is when the radiologist showed it to another radiologist, he immediately said it looked like lymphoma and he had a case like that just the prior week. The second case is a patient who has pancre pancreatic cancer after pancreatectomy. The left-sided CT image is the initial postoperative CT which shows an mental infarct in the anterior abdomen. The right is a CT performed three months later that shows evolution of the mental infarct. These lesions are called mental infarct on both reports. If we fast forward to May 2018, there is a repeat CT exam done for other reasons, and the interpreting radiologist now calls the mental infarct a peritoneal implant. An abdominal MRI is performed to evaluate a liver lesion. The radiologist interpreting the MRI calls the omental infarct a peritoneal implant. This is an example of alliterative bias. This occurs because radiologists read the reports of previous examinations before looking at the newly obtained imaging and are therefore more apt to adopt the same opinion as that rendered by a colleague, even if that opinion was incorrect. The characteristics of type 1 thinking are pattern recognition of a peritoneal implant, which was incorrect, ignoring the imaging features that are not characteristic of malignant implants. For example, on the MRI, there was no restricted diffusion or no enhancement that would indicate that this was an implant, and not reviewing prior imaging beyond the most recent study. The intervention is to review prior radiologist reports after reviewing the prior imaging, current imaging, and rendering an interpretation so as not to be influenced by the prior radiologist's interpretation.
Case 3 is an abdominal x-ray performed with an indication of small bowel obstruction. The interpreting radiologist correctly identifies dilated loops of small bowel and says that this is concerning for small bowel obstruction. However, the patient is three days post-op from having surgery to address the patient's bowel obstruction. The radiologist did not know this and therefore incorrectly interpreted this as obstruction when it is most likely adenamic ileus. This is an example of framing bias, which is when we draw different conclusions from the same study based on how the information is presented and what questions are asked. The characteristics of type 1 thinking are being influenced by the clinical indication of SBO, pattern recognition of dilated small bowel, and ignoring the midline skim staples indicating recent surgery and another reason for having small bowel other than obstruction. The interventions are to initially review the imaging study without knowing the clinical indication or reason for exam so as to avoid any potential influence from the clinical indication and to seek out a more thorough clinical history from the electronic medical record or directly from the ordering provider given that the indications provided in imaging orders are often incomplete and occasionally spurious. Case 4 is a 55-year-old female with pancreatic adenocarcinoma who was referred to an academic center to have MRI imaging. This is performed in order to determine if she is borderline resectable or non-resectable. She has already received neoadjuvant chemotherapy. The radiologist looking at the current MRI exam looks at the CT exam from several months before and identifies two liver lesions that were not described by the outside radiologist. Now, it is a common scenario in this setting for outside imaging and outside radiologists to miss subtle liver metastases. The radiologist reviewing this prior CT thinks that these likely represent another case of missed liver metastases. However, when we look at these areas on the MRI exam, we see that they are bright on the in-phase sequences shown on the left, and they lose signal on the out-of-phase sequences on the right. This means that they represent focal fat, not liver metastases. This is an example of blind spot bias, which is when we focus on detecting and discussing the cognitive biases in others' behavior. The radiologist interpreting the MRI exam knows that liver metastases are a frequent miss. When he sees that there are liver lesions that were not identified by the prior radiologist, he incorrectly assumes that they represent liver metastases. The characteristics of type 1 thinking are being influenced by prior experience with diagnostic errors, pattern recognition of focal liver lesions in a patient with pancreatic cancer, and not reviewing all sequences in a systematic fashion. Increased awareness of the tendency to overcall known types of errors is one potential strategy to minimize the impact of this bias. Case 5 is a 29-year-old female with a primary bone tumor of the left femur who undergoes CT of the chest, abdomen, pelvis for staging. The radiologist interpreting this exam sees a speculated sclerotic lesion in the right iliac bone and is confident that this likely represents a bone island or some other benign lesion. However, because the patient is young and the radiologist is a subspecialist who doesn't often see patients with primary bone tumors, he recommends an MRI for further evaluation. The MRI is interpreted by an MSK radiologist as a benign lesion. This is an example of regret bias. This occurs when radiologists overestimate the probability of a serious or life-threatening diagnosis because of the remorse they would experience if the diagnosis were missed also known as defensive medicine. The characteristic of type 1 thinking is being influenced by prior experience with diagnostic errors and malpractice issues. The interventions are to develop and use evidence-based appropriateness criteria and standardized reporting systems to objectively state the probability of certain disease processes based on the presence of an imaging finding and thus make more unbiased recommendations about whether additional testing is warranted. You could also consult colleagues. K6 is a gentleman who has difficulty exhibiting over about 10 days. During this time, he has multiple head CTs and chest x-rays. And it isn't until a radiologist looks at the scalp view when she determines that he has an aspirated dental plate, and this is likely contributing to his difficulty extubating. This finding was not imaged on the chest x-rays and was not visible on the axial images of the CTs of the head. 
and this is why it was missed over multiple studies. It is a common scenario when a scout view covers a larger field of view than the CT images. This is an example of scout neglect bias, or the tendency to neglect the scout views because you don't think they will contain important information. The characteristic of type 1 thinking is not reviewing all images in a systematic fashion. The interventions are to routinely review the scout images and think about including a dedicated field in your report template called scout views. To summarize, there are several different types of cognitive biases, each with characteristic patterns of failed type 1 thinking. When we understand why cognitive errors occur, we can begin to develop interventions that prevent or mitigate cognitive biases that result in diagnostic errors. In the next module, we will review systematic causes of diagnostic errors.